Okay, guys, so this video, I want to make sure you know, is for the next two slides. The next two slides, which is, hang on a minute, which is what? Slides 9 and 10. 9 and 10. So I want you to be aware that what I talk about in this video is for both of those slides. I want to talk for the next two slides about the similarities between anorexia and bulimia. So I asked you to think about that. Um, I asked you to go back and think about what I just said on the prior three slides about the psychological and behavioral characteristics of people with anorexia, bulimia, and binge eating disorder, and try to draw some similarities and dissimilarities between them before we move on. And by the way, here you go. It had to happen eventually. My pup Silas became jealous. He sat long enough. He's had enough. And he said, Mom, I'm going to photobomb your video, and I'm going to hump your blanket. So there he is, everybody, Silas. All right, let's go on to talk about some of the common psychological characteristics that people with anorexia and bulimia share in common. And think about whether or not you came up with these when I asked you to try to draw some parallels between these different disorder categories. Um, one, maladaptive perfectionism. No, Silas. Maladapt ba See, he makes me not be able to talk. Maladaptive perfectionism and high achievement striving. Remember, in both cases, um, the individual is concerned about trying to achieve a certain body weight. Um, the difference is that whereas anorectic people, people diagnosed with anorexia, see their unhealthy eating patterns as evidence of their high achievement, people with bulimia don't. They want to be high achieving. They want to have perfectionistic outcomes, but they actually feel shame in their attempt to try to control their eating habits. So Psychologically speaking, both people with anorexia and bulimia more generally have perfectionistic tendencies and high achievement striving. You know a lot about perfectionism. Um, in this case, it's more the maladaptive perfectionism, not the adaptive perfectionism that you learned about. So remember in your brain, tell yourself, what was the difference between our maladaptive and our adaptive perfectionist, right? The adaptive perfectionist had high achievement goals. They were very orderly and planful, but they were not anxious, upset, or um, otherwise experiencing distress if they didn't meet those goals. Remember, our maladaptive perfectionist had the high achievement striving and the plans and the goals, but they also had the guilt the frustration and the stress that results from feeling like they're not meeting them. That's the type of perfectionism that people with anorexia and bulimia experience. Both people with anorexia and bulimia are very, 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 how many varies was that? Very, very, very self-critical. They're extremely hard on themselves. Any small thing they do that isn't the perfection that they expect of themselves it really impacts their view of themselves. They have low self-esteem in general. Now, again, people with anorexia enhance their self-esteem by restricting and maintaining this very strict intake of food. It helps to enhance theirs. Whereas people with bulimia have a detraction from their self-esteem when they go through those out of control binge cycles. Body dysmorphia is common to both. And you know, I've, I've, it should be drummed into your head now. I've said it enough times in different contexts, in different lectures, what body dysmorphia is. So I'm not going to repeat it again here, but they share that misperception of their body in common with regard to how it looks, its shape, and its weight. Very common for people with anorexia and bulimia to also be diagnosed with comorbid depression or other forms of mood disorders. Seasonal affective disorder is one such disorder. Seasonal affective disorder involves an experience wherein people are experiencing more depressive symptomology at certain times of the year, particularly when there is not as much sunlight and it's dark more. Uh, more often than it is light, and it gets dark earlier. Um, but it is very common for people with bulimia and anorexia to be diagnosed with major depression, for example. Um, and especially with bulimia, 
It has been suggested that those out of control binge periods are an attempt to self-medicate the depression, are an attempt to self-soothe with the intake of comfort foods. And as you know, from a prior discussion on food addiction, there is a biochemical reason that that helps. Remember the serotonin, remember that intaking high sugar foods, especially, but high, high, I was going to say high sugar, high fat foods. You see what's happening here? High sugar, high fat foods, remember from food addiction discussions that we've had, increases serotonin in your brain and increases in serotonin alleviate depression and anxiety. Uh, Silas, no, no puppy. Oh, this dog, I tell you guys, makes it difficult to work from home. Um... Phobias, panic, and generalized anxiety disorder. Also common comorbid disorders in people who have been diagnosed with anorexia and bulimia. These are all forms of anxiety disorders, as you know from way, 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 go back, 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 to the beginning of the semester when we talked about toxic emotions. I mentioned generalized anxiety disorder, not panic as much or phobias. These are all forms of anxiety, no Silas, these are all forms of anxiety disorders. So again, it has been suggested by some psychologists that eating disorders are mechanisms for coping with these very uncomfortable adverse emotional states. And again, when I talk about bulimia, I want you to think about the fact that that comfort food intake in very high quantity could be a way to self-medicate anxiety. Remember, increase in serotonin, decrease in anxiety. Irritability is common in people with anorexia and bulimia. No, Silas, no, go. And you can think about different reasons why that might be, right? Um, just the eating alone, whether for people with anorexia, it's the restriction, that can lead to biochemical changes that create anxiety and create irritability as well and depression. Remember when we talked about toxic emotions, some of the same biochemical avenues help to explain toxic emotions. Um, social incompetence or perceived social incompetence. People with eating disorders often are socially uncomfortable, experience some social anxiety, uh, fear, embarrassment, and humiliation, or just aren't comfortable interacting with others, or they think that they're awkward in public, even though other people don't see themselves. Uh, other people don't see them that way. They think other people do. Um, insomnia or the opposite, oversleeping or hypersomnia. Um, again, insomnia, the person cannot fall asleep hypersomnia, the person sleeps too much. Now, sometimes it's difficult to separate those out from the comorbid depression because people with comorbid depression, people with depression have similar disordered sleep patterns. So it's hard to know whether it's the eating disorder relating to those disordered sleep patterns or the comorbid depression and anxiety creating it. Um, and finally, as I said, comorbid anxiety disorders. Um, panic disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, phobias, these are commonly diagnosed in people with anorexia and bulimia as well. Okay, and now before I end this video, I also want to talk about some of the cognitive similarities in people who are diagnosed with anorexia and bulimia. So cognitive, we mean thought process. We mean beliefs. We mean perceptions. We mean interpretations, okay? One. People with anorexia and bulimia tend to believe they are helpless or lack control over their circumstances in some form. Two, dichotomous thinking. This is a big one. This is a big one. When people are dichotomous thinkers, they're what we call black and white thinkers. They tend to see things in extreme categories without anything in between, any gradation, any gray area. So, in terms of the eating disordered patterns, their dichotomous thinking leads to extreme behavioral patterns. Because, for example, um, take somebody with bulimia. If they have a thinking pattern which indicates in order to stay lean and not get too fat or obese, which is one of their fears, they have to restrict their diet. 
and they create for themselves a very restrictive ideal. Remember, they are perfectionists, so they create a very strict ideal. Then if they were to eat something that's outside that very restrictive ideal pattern, they feel that they violated what their goal was. And instead of looking at it in terms of just because I ate a little bit more than I planned for, or just because I ate something a little bit high calorie or high sugar or high fat, that's okay. I didn't ruin everything. I didn't ruin my pursuit of my goal. That's how a non-dichotomous thinker would think of things. But a dichotomous thinker, of her, I can't talk. A dichotomous thinker, of her, that's not a word. A dichotomous thinker, remember, very importantly, sees things in black and white, all or nothing, extreme terms. Once they violate even, even a little itty bitty bit, once they violate even a little bit their ideal plan for eating and maintaining their weight that is ideal, they think, oh, fuck it. I ruined everything. I can't do this. I'm not in control. I'm helpless. I can't control myself. And they go the complete opposite direction and binge. And we call this abstinence violation effects. Abstinence violation effects, where people will engage who have bulimia, for example, will engage, it will trigger an out of control, high caloric, high fat, high sugar intake binge episode after they have violated or neglected to be able to adhere to an excessively restrictive eating pattern. Now, this shouldn't be too hard to conceptualize even if you've never experienced an eating disorder because you may yourself have said or heard family members or friends say, oh, I'm going to I'm going to go on a diet. I'm going to stop eating, I don't know, you know, I'm going to stop eating sugar. And then one day they have a sugar craving. They've been really good. They've gone, let's say, a week with no sugar or very little. And then they have a sugar craving and they give in and they eat a lot of sugar or a lot of cookies or something. Sometimes people will go, ah, well, fuck it. I already ate two cookies. May as well eat 10. That abstinence violation that triggers an excessive response opposite of what we planned for is very similar to what happens in abstinence violation effects for dichotomous thinkers diagnosed with eating disorders. Um, and then finally, people with anorexia and bulimia also experience cognitive distortions. Now, dichotomous thinking is a type of cognitive distortion, but there are others as well. A cognitive distortion is a way of thinking about, interpreting, or perceiving a situation that is out of line with its reality in some form or exa exaggerates it. Here we're talking about thinking patterns that are disordered with regard to the size and shape of the body. So people with anorexia who are dangerously underweight nonetheless believe their bodies are too heavy or overweight. Um, cognitive distortions about the link, this one's important, about the link between body image and worth. So a cognitive distortion that people with anorexia and bulimia both have is this idea that their self-worth is excessively or entirely determined by the shape and size of their body. Cognitive distortions about nutrition and the consequences it has on the body. This one is very important, so much so that part of the treatment for anorexia and bulimia is what we call psychoeducation, psychoeducation. And what that essentially is, is a fancy word for teaching people in almost like a classroom type setting or classroom type process like I'm doing here, teaching people with eating disorders about how the intake of food actually impact, impact, impacts. I made up a lot of words today, guys. Teaching people with anorexia and bulimia how the intake of food actually impacts metabolic processes, how eating patterns impact weight loss and weight gain, because some studies indicate that people with anorexia and bulimia have a misunderstanding of how eating patterns, how certain types of food, et cetera, impact metabolic rate and how metabolism and weight loss is impacted by eating. So for example, if I eat one cookie, I'll gain five pounds. Well, that's not how the body works, right? Or if I fast in between eating, I'll lose weight more quickly. Well, actually that's not true. Fasting especially if you do it too frequently, can lower your metabolic rate and make it more difficult for you to lose weight. Because if your body is not regularly getting 
intake of calories or nutrition, it is more likely to slow its metabolic rate down to hold on to what it has to feed its homeostatic processes, right? So I always tell people, restricting your intake, fasting too much is going to lower your metabolic rate and work against you, work against you. It'd be like, if you knew you were going to get $2,000 a week, whether you worked or didn't do anything, your motivation to work to make money would be lower, right? If you're not going to get any money for months and months and months at a time, you're hopefully going to save the money you have so you have a sufficient amount over time to carry out your financial needs. Similarly, if you regularly feed your body, albeit appropriate amounts and healthful foods, your metabolic rate will maintain or speed up because it's not holding on to what you're giving it. It knows it's going to get more nutrition. If you start to teach your body that it's only going to get nutrition sporadically, then your body's a dynamic system and your body will recalibrate, so to speak, to say, hey, we better not burn off what we get as quickly because we might not get more nutrition to maintain homeostatic processes. Who knows for how long, right? So it's, it's a cognitive distortion to believe that the way people with these disorders are eating or what they're doing is going to be effective in maintaining weight or weight loss. Okay, I'm going to end this here, and then we will talk on the next video. Talk to you soon.